behalf of our community here at the Walla Walla University Church, we are delighted that you are joining us today for worship. We invite you to open your hearts to God as we gather to rekindle our hope in our Creator. You can learn more about our church community at our website, www.church.com. We are grateful to the many people and resources that make this broadcast ministry possible. And if you'd like to partner with us in this ministry, you can do so by following our link and donating on our church website. Thank you again for joining us today. Happy Sabbath. Good morning and welcome to the Walla Walla University Church. I'm Jeremy Foss, pastor of children and youth ministry here at the church. And I've wondered today, just think, looking forward to where we're going with our service, if you've ever asked yourself if you have enough. I know I've asked myself that question. Do I have enough? Do I have enough to give to the needs of those around me? Is there enough of me to fulfill the calling that God has placed on my heart. And today, I'm excited about where this service is going because it's going to talk about what is enough. What's in your hand? What do you have? Sometimes when we're in the middle of an experience like we've been in the last few years, it feels like even some of the things we have are taken away. And here, even in worship, we can feel that way sometimes. I was thinking about it, though, this morning, and in the context of what we have, that COVID is actually an opportunity for us, an opportunity to explore different ways of worship. Because have you ever thought what it would be like to lose some of your senses? What if you lost hearing? How would you worship if you couldn't hear a sermon and you couldn't hear music? What if you lost sight? 
What if you couldn't see things around you? What if you couldn't see a, a floral arrangement? Or you couldn't see the communion emblem set before you? How would you worship? Sometimes we get stuck in the way we think we can worship. And maybe this is an opportunity for us to see worship in new ways. Maybe today's the day that as you are here in the, in the service, and we are continuing to ask that, that you wear your masks and you physical distance and, and you also are not singing as a congregation, but maybe this is an opportunity for you as you sing to experience music in a new way. Maybe, maybe it's the time where you'll raise your hand and say, I agree with that part of the song. That moved me. Maybe it will be a moment of that. Maybe it will be a moment as you close your eyes and you think of what others have lost and be grateful for what you've been given. So many things we take for granted. So many gifts we've been given. I hope that today as we worship, we can focus on what has been given, what we have with us, and let God build and glorify that in our lives. We're going to stand together as, um, as we have a, the hymn number 11, which is the God of Abraham praise, performed here for us. And once again, I say performed because we're not going to be singing, but I want to invite you to experience this song in your heart in whatever way that touches you today. Jehovah, the great I am who sits on the throne, we're honored to be in your presence today. Honored that you would even notice us here on earth because you are so great and your name is above all names. Today we welcome you into our presence. 
We respond to your invitation to be here. Holy Spirit, please descend into this place, not because you wouldn't come already, but because we long for you. And if there's a place in us that doesn't long for you, I pray that you would open that place of our heart that is closed. We welcome you today. In the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. Parking on 4th Avenue or Fourth Street, I should say. I was making it sound even more exciting, calling it an avenue. Parking on Fourth Street is going to get a little bit more exciting in the next few weeks, and that is not because they're installing some meters for you to start paying to park there. It's because there is going to be a project that's a combination between the City of College Place, Blue Zones Project, and Walla Walla University which are partnering together to create a temporary cycle track. It's going to run along 4th Street from Davis to College Avenue. That temporary cycle track is actually an, exist, an, an extension of the existing track that is running down along, Academy, along the Academy Way. So the temporary track is going to be put in place. It's going to be for a week or two that it's put in place, and there will be no parking during that time. So it's going to start on October 20 when uh, it is the University Student uh, Volunteer Global Service Day. Parking is going to be available along the children's, north of the children's wing, along Davis Street, behind the Hafner House, and at the Alumni Center. This track is not going to be permanently installed at this time, but it will be installed next summer. So that's kind of, kind of an exciting thing to have an extension of that happening. The other thing I want to share with you is something coming up at the end of October. October 31 is Halloween. And I have to be honest with you, there is not much I like about Halloween. In fact, I have gone into some of the, I, I like costumes and I like getting some, some things for different projects that I do. And so sometimes I've gone into the Halloween store that they'll set up and I'll go in and sometimes there'll be some good deals on some costuming there. But what always strikes me when I walk into that place is the darkness. There is just such darkness around Halloween and it seems to get darker and darker every year. This morning, in fact, in my inbox, I saw a thing where you could decorate your whole party with an Ouija, Ouija board kind of theme. And it just goes to show where the heart of Halloween lies. It really is in darkness. There's a lot of darkness that we see around us. Um, however, there's one thing I love about Halloween, and that is that it's the one time of the year when people in the community, on their own accord, come out of their houses and come to our houses, come to places where we are. And there's two ways that people deal with this. One is to be open a door and be hospitable. Another one is to hospitable. The other one is to hide in the basement. So, and, and I've, I've talked to people on both spectrums here, but I've been more and more convicted over the years that this is a time to be hospitable. It's a time to say, if you show up at my door, I am gonna love you. So I'm encouraging you as a congregation, if there's a way you can love people that night, do it. Um, here at the church, we are going to be doing something that extends that hospitality and love. And I, and I have to say, it's, in my mind, it's more than just a Halloween alternative. I feel more like it's an onslaught against the darkness out there. We are going to be having Bible characters that are going to be in, a, in something called a glow walk, running from 6 to 8 in the evening. These Bible carrier characters are going to be dressed in costumes. They're going to give short little snippets of their, of their story. And as they do that, they're going to hand out candies that go along with their story. Now, I'm not going to tell you all of what that would look like, because it's always fun and surprising to see what people are handing out with their stories. But I will give you a clue. Here's one that I always think is really fun. 
Rahab tells her story of grace and, and saving as she hands out a red vine twizzler. There's an example for you. Something that, that ties the story together but leaves kids as they leave saying, wow, that was fun. I got something fun out of this. But the story of Jesus is told and as they exit, light goes into the darkness as we send them off with little glow sticks and glow things that, that glow in the night. We're also going to have Pathfinders are helping us out with some bonfires and some hot chocolate and, and just kind of a warm atmosphere. So if you'd like to help out with this, I would love to get invitations out. We'd love to see community people coming and joining us. It's a come, as, as, come in and leave as you want sort of event. And so I would encourage you as members, we don't have I had a little problem with some of my graphic design, so we didn't get the brochures printed for this weekend. But next weekend and the following weekend, we'll have those that you could give to people and invite. You could also, you know, if we're moving this into an onslaught against darkness, it also is an invitation to pray because I believe when we step into darkness with light that we need prayer more than ever. So I'm going to ask you to pray for the event. I'm going to ask you too if there's any way you'd like to help participate contact me. Uh, my, my information is easily available at the, at the church office or in your bulletins. Um, but I would love to see the church involved in, in supporting this and also giving our kids a place where they can come and share light and take light into their community. So that's coming up. At this point, um, we also have for our children's story, Janet Wilkinson is going to be presenting that. And this will again be um, distance, uh, children's story, so you can participate by watching as that is presented. Happy Sabbath. I'm gonna tell you two really short stories and then play a song for you. About a week ago, I was with my grandson at his house and his mommy told him that he couldn't do something that he wanted to do. And he was sad and he told his mom, I'm sad, I wanna do that. And she said, well, that's not safe for you to do, so we can't do it. And so he kind of went to his room sad and I went in there with him and we started playing with one of his favorite toy trucks. And in a little bit, he looked at me and he said, grandma, I'm happy, I'm not sad anymore. And I was so proud of him for figuring out that he could change his emotions and he could feel happy even though he had been sad because he couldn't do something he wanted to do. A similar thing happened to my other grandson who's almost three and he was going to his cousin's house who are a lot older than him, they're nine and 11 and he hadn't been there for a while. And we got to the house and he said to his mom, I'm nervous and his mom said, well, that's normal. Can you tell me why you're feeling nervous? He said, because I haven't been to their house for a long time. So he and his mom talked about his emotion and they went into the house and his mom stayed near him until he felt comfortable. And pretty soon I could tell he was so comfortable because look at this. They were throwing and kicking this big ball and falling in the grass with each other and wrestling each other around and he was so happy and he was no longer nervous at all. We all have emotions and times where we feel sad or mad or helpless or embarrassed or somebody says something that hurts us and we just feel this, this big hurt inside of us and it's normal. And God gave us our emotions to help us, to give us information to know why something is happening around us that we need to do something about. So don't be afraid of your emotions. Just learn how to take care of them. A couple nights ago, I was sad about something that happened to me. So I sat down and I talked to my husband and explained what was going on. And I knew why I was sad. And then we watched an old funny show that made us laugh and laugh. And pretty soon I didn't feel sad anymore. And so I encourage you, when you feel one of these emotions, sad, lonely, embarrassed, or hurt, or mad, or frustrated, talk to somebody about it who will listen to you and help you understand why am I feeling this way? Because if you know why, 
that it helps you be able to do something about it. And then go do something like my grandsons did that can make you feel better and change how you feel. But it's important to feel your emotion, don't stuff it away, but then do something that will make you feel better. So now I'm gonna play this song for you that my grandson sings. And it's about, it's okay to feel sad, but little by little, you'll feel better again. I'm gonna have him sing it for you. Remember, little by little, you'll feel better again. We want to thank you as a congregation for your generosity that you have given over and over, both locally and also in, in the global aspect of things. Today, our offering is going to be for the university church budget. And that budget would include things like youth and young adult ministries, children's ministries, family ministries, broadcasting. Also, portions go to our schools. And so, in order to do that, I know as always, this is interesting at this time where we don't collect here in, in person. You can put your tithe offering envelopes into the connect boxes either in the lobby or over by the church office. You can also donate directly onto the phone via, on your phone via the cash app.
As I mentioned earlier, sometimes the needs that surround us and go throughout our globe are so immense it's hard to even know where to start when we start talking to God about them. So once again, we have to start with what we know and what we have. What we have in our hand here in our church today, and what you might have in your hand right now if you pull up your little prayer card sheet that most likely was handed out if you got a bulletin, has some prayer requests on there for local prayers. We have, um, and this one I don't think was listed on there, but Lyle Hatley is going to be having neck surgery coming up this week on Monday. And so they would appreciate some prayer. Emil Reynolds passed away, um, Cheryl Weiss's father, last weekend. And even though services have happened, um, that grief just continues. And so I'd like to invite you to keep the family in prayer as well. And also remember that donations um, for him and, and the family can go to Gospel Outreach. Herb Waters is also in patient rehab following a fall and broken hip. Definitely could use some prayer. And Larry and Lois Canaday could use some prayer as Lois is recovering from brain surgery that she had earlier this week. All heavy matters that could invite our prayers today. I'm sure you've come with your own burdens of heart, and if I were to sit down with each one of you, you could tell me what those are. And so today what I'd like to invite you to do, if, if, if you feel like you have something that's just heavy on your heart, and it could be a prayer request, but even a praise might be there as well. As we pray together, just raise your hand up to God. It's kind of like one of those moments saying, yes, this is something I want to lift before your throne as well, God. And so we're going to pray together now. Um, Justin Corral is going to be praying for us. He's a biology major, and I'd invite you to kneel at this point. Oh, precious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being here amongst us, Lord. I do not feel worthy to be calling on your name, Lord, to be here after a busy week where I don't feel like I gave you enough time, Lord, where I feel like I haven't been close to you as of lately. But Lord, I know that you still hear us, regardless of the time, regardless of our busy weeks, Lord, you're still there. and. As much as I don't feel worthy, Lord, I want to lead this congregation to you. I want to pray that you help our hearts open up to you. And as broken as they are, as all the problems that go on throughout the week weigh us down, we still know that you're there, Lord. We lift those burdens that we have, and we know that you'll answer our prayers. Therefore, we can praise you for the good things that you do in our lives, Lord. I want to lift up three people in, spe in special, Lord. I want to lift up Cheryl and Herb and Lewis, Lord. They're all going through tough times, tough things that they've gone through today. And I want to pray for each and every one that is here too, Lord, for all those addictions that we might have in our lives, for those things that we are missing, Lord. We pray that you satisfy our hearts and give us what we need in the time that you see fit, Lord. Build our faith and help us to worship you today, Lord, as we open our hearts during communion and as we remember the sacrifice that you gave us, Lord. We pray this all in your name. Amen.
Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you. Then the Lord said to him, what is that? He replied, the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake and it turned back in to the staff in his hand. Uh, good to be with all of you today. Um, I sat as near to the heart of God was being played and realized I had been lied to because I'd asked Sophie very specifically before she played if I was going to cry when she played. <laughs> and when she was playing near to the heart of God with Dr. Scott, you know, my, I, I was just losing control to hear such beauty come and to be reminded that when we come together, we come and God meets us here. Uh, what an absolute gift we have in our musicians, in our music department, in those who use their gifts to bring us closer to God. Just phenomenal. Thank you. Listen, today uh, the sermon, you're going to have to track with me because there are going to be three distinct parts to it. And I don't need you to be confused, so I'm going to give you a warning. The first part is going to be some table talk between us as family. We're glad if you're joining us online, and you may not be part of our church, but you watch. This first part will not be for you. You can just eavesdrop and listen to a family conversation. The second part is going to be the main sermon, and then we're going to move to our last part, which will be communion. So let's begin with, uh, the fa with family talk. Now, those of you who have been here for a while have been incredibly generous in your giving, and this church is only able to do what it does because of the way in which you have supported the many ministries of the church. But I do need to give you just a little bit of information. Most of you know this. Some of you don't. There are two buckets that we use at the university church. The first bucket uh, is labeled tithe when it comes to your financial partnership with us. Tithe just means 10%. And there are many of you who have faithfully given 10% of your income toward the service of God your entire life. When you give tithe that 10%, 75% of it goes toward pastoral wages for the entire conference, not just here, the entire conference, and also for the teachers. And then there's others which go for the administration at the Upper Columbia Conference and also the Pacific Union. Bucket number one. Bucket number two, this is the church budget. And so when you give to the church budget, what does it do? I hear this question all the time. Where does my money go, Pastor Andreas? 45% of it goes for our kids. It goes to Rogers. It goes to Wava. And then a 36% goes for church operations. You know, I was reading earlier um, about the history of this church when it was built in 1962. Was at that time the largest Adventist church in the world. I don't think it is anymore. But this uh, church needs some budget for church operation. And then the last part you will see are the uh, ministries that we have. And this last slide gives you an idea of where we are so far received to date in bucket number two. This is the church budget. This is where we help our kids pay for the schools and run the operations of the church. This is the place of ministry for outreach, for reaching this community. And this is where we are. You have been incredibly generous, and we want to give you this heads up 
So when you go back to your kitchen table and you sit with your spouse or you go and look at your own budget, maybe with this information you may decide to make a new decision and perhaps if you've never done it before, you may decide to make a one-time donation as we move towards fulfilling the ministry of this church. Am I clear on that? Is that clear? That's good. I see some nods. I, I see some, some other people who are looking at me who are saying, I don't like talking about money in church. Don't worry. You're going to get more uncomfortable when the sermon starts. <laughs> I am, I'm literally going to make you very uncomfortable this entire sermon. And I'm going to ask you at the end of the sermon to make a decision. So I'm giving you fair warning. You will be uncomfortable and you will be asked to make a decision. Would you pray with me as we enter part two of our sermon today. Father in heaven, thank you for being near to our hearts. Thank you for your presence that abides with us so graciously. And Lord, for these next few moments, for those who are sitting here, for those who are joining us from home, we invite your spirit to be with us, to make us more like Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. So here is the uncomfortable part that we're going to start our sermon with. I want to ask all of you and present you all with a unique opportunity, a unique life-changing opportunity this Wednesday here at Walla Walla University. You may be asking, what is this unique opportunity? Well, on Wednesday morning, if you are a Walla Walla University student from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m., you can be involved in helping this community be a better place. How? You can help to rebuild homes. You can clean up parks. You can restore trails. You can spend time with those who are isolated. You can package foods. You can beautify the city. You can help to make a cycle track. And you can do all of that when you go to wallawalla.edu. If you are not a student, you have the opportunity this coming Wednesday to join us from 6.30 uh, 6.30 to 7.30 at the university church in the youth room. You will come and then you will be sent out to be involved in some incredible opportunities that will change the lives of those who are members here and members outside. I am so serious about this that I am asking that every single one of you be there on Wednesday. Not 5%, not 10%, not 50 we are looking for a hundred percent participation. Cancel your date night. Tell your daughter you're going to miss volleyball practice. Tell your aunt dinner will have to wait until next week. Call your supervisor and tell them you can't make the shift because you have something very important to do. I think I heard an amen, which is shocking for me. Because the aim of this is to make you uncomfortable. And you're thinking, well, who are you to tell me what to do with my Wednesday night? How do you know what my plans are? And you're asking me to cancel those plans to come to church for some activities. Don't you already know that I'm involved? And as I hear the confusion and I look at some of your faces and you are very placid, and you're very silent, and you're wondering why the pastor would subject you to such a blunt opening in a sermon, I would like to welcome you into our story for today. Because what you are feeling is just a slice of the cocktail of emotion that Moses would have felt when God comes to him as an 80-year-old man, ambushes him, pun intended, and tells him to drop everything and to follow his call. We read the story and we think, oh, Moses didn't have any plans. What was Moses doing with his life? Moses could just turn around, sell everything he had, and go thousands of miles to where God needed him. But that is not the case. God comes and asks Moses to interrupt his life, and it's not an easy call. If you're joining us for the first time today, you're in town, you're visiting a friend, you're watching for the first time online, we are in the middle of our sermon series, The Question God Asks. And we've been looking at questions that God asks. In Genesis, he asked Adam and Eve, where are you? In Genesis, he asked Jacob, um, what does he ask Jacob? What is your name? 
And today we are in the story of Moses when he asked Moses, what's in your hand? And all of us have things in our lives that fill us with dread. We see it coming a mile off and we just don't want to deal with it. It could be a messy relationship. It could be a difficult colleague. When we see it coming, we want no part of it. One thing which I hate doing, and maybe you're like me, is doing taxes with apologies to the accountants among us. Nobody likes doing their taxes. And imagine if you had to do your taxes, not under the regular circumstances, but you were given, let's say, five days to fill out your entire tax report and to send it in. If you were only given a one-week deadline, most of us would lose our mind, because I would. For example, uh, you would want to know that you have the ability to send it to your accountant to make sure that you've crossed every T and dotted every I. Nobody likes to do taxes under normal circumstances, and the deadline would make us lose our mind. Bathrooms, laundry, who likes to do that? Nobody. And imagine if you had to do these chores in the middle of your workday during your lunch break, you would probably not be a happy camper. And then I wonder about Moses and how he felt when he's shepherding his sheep, maybe on his lunch break, he's eating some figs, He's just broken off some bread, and in the middle of his ordinary day, God comes to him, and he says, Moses, I need you to drop everything. I need you to move your family, and I need you to go back to Egypt. Let's read this conversation, picking it up in Exodus chapter 7. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And Moses... I think is hearing God loud and clear because God is basically saying, Moses, I have a plan to to rescue the Hebrews in Egypt and you're the plan. And I think often we hear this and we hear this through really sanitized ears. We're thinking of Charlton Heston and we're thinking about Moses as this hero who is so happy to be chosen by God and who is going to begin the hero's journey on behalf of Yahweh. We imagine that Moses is maybe jumping with joy because God has chosen him and he's going to do something heroic. That's not what is happening. I think that Moses, when he meets God at the burning bush and God says, go back to Israel, go back to Egypt, Moses is hearing not the glorious beginning of a hero's journey, but he is hearing a frightening request to return to the place of his greatest failure. Because when you read Exodus, you will read that Moses made a decision that was consequential and changed the trajectory of his life forever. A decision that he regretted that caused him pain, shame, and embarrassment. And now God is asking him to go back to the place where he made his biggest mistake. And I think we've all had moments like this. (laughs) You you froze during an elementary school play and you forgot all of your parts and and run off stage crying. You know, you remember that. And you never want to go back. In fact, I don't have this here, but I wrote this and I realized, oh, there's a reason I wrote this one because that sort of happened to me. I was in um, in, uh, Sound of Music. I was Captain Von Trapp in Sound of Music. And there was a part, there's a song, that, that uh, Captain Von Trapp sings is Edelweiss. And I was singing it, and I remember it, the key moment in the song, that was when my voice broke. I was about 11. I went down two or so octaves in the middle of the song, and it was just a mess. And I, I, can, never, I can never watch Sound of Music without remembering that moment. Some of us, it's not an elementary school, but it was a disastrous quarterly report you had to give in front of your board. 
and that uh, report went terribly. You had forgotten multiple decks in your slideshow. The PowerPoint froze when your kid FaceTimed you halfway through your presentation, and nobody smiled when you were falling apart. Or you were at summer camp in 2005, and you ended up in a cabin with all the mean girls and spent half your time crying and hiding from them, and you never want to go back. And here's Moses being asked by God to go back to his moment of greatest shame and embarrassment. And I think this is where Moses' mind is at the burning bush and where lots of us find ourselves when God confronts us in our life and wants us to do something that makes us uncomfortable. When God comes to us with an opportunity, most of us have something in the back of our mind that is screaming, no. Screaming every reason under the sun why we cannot do it. And so Moses panics, just like we do. In this conversation, Moses gives five excuses. He gives God five excuses why he cannot do what God is calling him to do. The first one that Moses gives, we find in Exodus 3, verse 11. But Moses said to God, who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He has a fear of being inadequate. Moses is saying, I'm a nobody, God. I have no influence in the halls of power. I'm not well known. No one knows my name. I have no clout. I have no standing. I don't come from an influential family. I didn't even have a father growing up. You've got the wrong guy. And then Moses, as if God doesn't know this already, I'm sure says, God, you might want to run a background check on me as well. Because you'll find that I'm actually, you know, I have a felony charge and I'm a fugitive on the run. You definitely have the wrong guy, God. Trust me. And when I read Moses' story, I sympathize with him. Because Moses has been realistic. He's realistic about the gap between his ability and the task God has called him to. He's saying, God, there's a cavernous gap between this. There's a Grand Canyon-sized gap between my ability and what you're asking me to do. And then God continues to talk to Moses because Moses will not be moved. And honestly, like I said, I think Moses is showing some common sense. Let's remove ourselves from the Bible story, and let's look at this with a, with a set of clear eyes. Imagine with me, imagine with me, if you have a physician or a surgeon in your family, let's say they are a heart surgeon. It probably took them four years of undergrad, and then another four years of medical school, and another five to seven years of training before they could become a heart surgeon. And, it, and if you were walking with someone, you just met them, and after a 30 minute conversation, they said, you know, you, you just really impressed me, and I have, I'm so optimistic about the things you can do in your life. And then they said, I, I have a neighbor, and, and my neighbor has, has some heart issues. I, I don't know if maybe next week you could come over and perform heart surgery for them. You'd look at them and say, that's a hard no, I'm going to pass. And you'd probably call the police because they're crazy. Nobody would, would go and perform heart surgery because you know it's a specialized task. And if you do it and you are not qualified, you will call irreparable harm and likely kill someone. This is what Moses is thinking. God, you want me to go and rescue the slaves from the hand of the biggest superpower in the world in a place I'm already a fugitive. To Moses, this call sounds like a suicide mission. But God persists, and the dialogue continues, and when I read it, forgive me, but it sounds a little like a sitcom between God and Moses. <laughs> because God speaks to Moses... And he replies to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 12, when Moses is um, afraid of being inadequate. God says this to him, because Moses says, I can't do it, you've got the wrong guy. This is what God says. I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Okay, who sees the humor here? Tell me it's not just me. Because it seems to me there is a line missing. 
God says there will be a sign that you can do an impossibly complex and dangerous task. But where is it? Because I didn't remove anything from the text. It seems like God is telling him the sign that I'm with you will be when you go and do what you don't want to do and it works. And I'm like, you know what, God, I'd also have a problem with this. If someone was to say, hey, I believe in your ability to fly 747 from Seattle to London Heathrow, and I said, cool, how are you going to prove that's the case? What's the supernatural sign that I will know that somehow I have this ability? And they said, oh, oh, don't worry. The sign that you can do it is when you fly the plane from Seattle to London. I'd be like, I'm out, not doing it. And this is what, this is the conversation God is having with Moses. It's hilarious. Moses does not want to do it. And God is saying, don't worry, the proof is in the pudding. When you do it, then you know I was with you. My goodness. And then Moses continues. He's like, okay, God did not quite get that. So let me go to excuse number two. So this is excuse number two of five. And Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses here has a fear of being ignorant, of not knowing enough to answer the questions that may come when he walks in God's calling. And all of us know the feeling when you're talking to someone, they're a specialist in an area, you don't know what they're talking about, you fake it till you make it, you nod as if you know, and you wait until you can actually understand something in the conversation. Because it's embarrassing when you're in a situation where you just don't know and you feel ignorant. And so Moses does not want to go for fear of being ignorant and not being able to explain when people ask him questions. Exodus chapter 3. If you're with me there, you'll see that verses 15 and 17. God continues his dialogue. We won't read it, but when he continues his dialogue, he responds to um, Moses' fear of being ignorant and not knowing enough in a very strange way. It seems like God is ignoring him. Because what God does is he doesn't say, Moses, don't worry, I'm going to give you the wisdom that you need. Instead, God responds to his fear of ignorance by telling him a story. What story? He recounts the covenant of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob for the third time in the conversation. Moses is focused on himself because he's afraid, but God is trying to turn his attention to something else. And here's the point I want to make. I don't want you to lose this. And it happens not just to Moses, but to all of us. When you are afraid of something, this, is, this can be anything in your life, you take so much energy trying to deal with your fear that sometimes your emotions are misdirected and you are unable to see through. So Moses' fear is causing his attention to be misdirected. And God tells him a story about his ancestors because he wants Moses to recognize that it's not about him, but it's about God's story. And as I read this text this morning, I thought, yep, Andreas, this is so true, isn't it? Being a follower of Jesus Christ, following God, is not about fixating on our shortcomings because we all have a bunch of them, but it's about focusing on his faithfulness. If all we do is focus on what we can and cannot do, all of us would never move. We would never do anything. We would never try anything because you would be like me. You would have a list of excuses the length of my arm. And so when Moses gives excuses, God says, it's not about you, it's about me. You're asking the wrong questions. It's about my identity. It's about my faithfulness. So let's summarize Exodus chapter 3 in this way before we go to 4. We can summarize the entire chapter of Exodus chapter 3 in this way, that God wants to open Moses' eyes and reframe his mind. That's what this entire conversation is. He wants to open his eyes and reframe his mind. And this is the work of the Spirit that has always been at work in our life, that the Spirit, when He calls us, wants to awake us to His purpose, to open our eyes and to reframe our minds. 
One of the questions that I get from students a lot, in fact, yesterday I was talking to a student and they were asking this question. It's a perennial question. And it's this question of how do I experience God? I have a relationship with God. My relationship with God feels dry. My relationship with God has come to a dead end. You know, I had an uncle who was really useful and helpful in my life. I had a grandparent who, who would pray with me. But, but it's been five years, 10 years, 20 years. How do I have a relationship with God? How do I experience God? And the story of the burning bush. Oh, yeah, Jose, thank you. I'm, I'm getting all my steps in and burning my calories for my Apple Watch. So if, if any of you would like to know a, a really good way to, to do that, I would recommend preaching. It does wonders for your, for your steps and calories. <laughs> and so here we, here we have all of us asking this question about how we can have a relationship with God. And, and Moses experiences this. He goes to a burning bush, and his experience tells me a couple of things. It tells me this, that number one, God treats us with dignity and respect in entering into a relationship with us. God does not come and brute force himself into your life. He doesn't like kick the door down and say, you're going to have me in your life whether you like it or not. God does not force himself where he's not wanted. And then you may say, hey, hey, but Andreas, he just came in a burning bush. Yes, I'm getting there. <laughs> God may sometimes come to us in a burning bush, but that is only the beginning. God's ultimate goal, and it always has been, is to be in honest dialogue and authentic relationship with us. If you want to experience God, there is a sense in which, like Moses, you need to have the ability to recognize that the everyday, ordinary things around you, outside of church, outside of the religious paraphernalia that comes with being a Christian, are opportunities for God to speak to your life if your eyes are open. God invites Moses into conversation with him in a desert, and he invites you into conversation with him in Walla Walla. God engages our mind and this is important, and not just our senses, because he wants to be in relationship with us. God engages our mind and not just our senses because our behavior follows our belief. And so God wants to work with our mind, not overwhelm our senses. God does not come to us with pyrotechnics, with fireworks, and with um, a light show just so we can say, wow, isn't that amazing? No, God wants to get our attention so that we can get in a relationship with him. And all of us need to practice being with God and interrogating our ideas about God. What we found so far in this series is that if you think God is out to get you, you will run and you will spend time hiding. If you think that God wants the best for you, you will be open to his invitation and you will say yes. Because at the end of the day, I think all of us live at the mercy of our ideas about God. Okay, let's go to Exodus chapter 4 verse 1. We're coming to our scripture reading for today. Moses answered, what if, this is excuse number what now? Three, thank you. <laughs> what if they don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to me? So here is a, a, another fear. His fear is of being ignored. Number two is fear of being ignorant. Number three is the fear of being ignored. He says, what if they don't listen to me? What if they, they think I have no standing and no status? And they're like, no, nah, we're good, Moses. Please leave. And I think it's ironic that Moses is still given excuses, and this one is a fear of being ignored when he is not scared of continuing a relationship with the burning, fiery presence of the everlasting God of the universe. Moses is petrified about the prospect of talking to his neighbors and to his own people, but he's okay talking to God. I feel like there, there's, a, there's a book to be written there about the ways in which we can sometimes uh, be okay with that which is distance and religious and, and contained, but when we have to move from, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We move from, 
you, you want to give me the word. What's, we're moving from abstraction. I knew you'd give me the word. We move from abstraction to practice. All of a sudden, we don't want to do it. So we will be okay to, to, to read the Bible and to do a, a three-hour Bible study, but if we need to go and talk to our neighbor, to someone flesh and blood, we're like, God, I'm good. Let me just do a couple more hours of Bible study. Then we're cool, right? So Moses is okay talking to God for, for hours. He'd have gone on talking to God, but when God says, go and talk to your people, Moses says, no. And then verse 2, this is our scripture reading. Thank you for reading, Naomi. I'm going to walk over here. The cameras didn't know I'm going to do this. So you're going to lose me in the light, but don't worry. We're all good. Courtesy of Pastor Troy. Here we go. Let's read Exodus chapter 4, verse 2. God asks him a question. What's the question? What's in your hand? And this is a fascinating question because Moses... Uh, probably replies and says, this is what's in my hand, a staff, a very ordinary staff. If God said to you, what's in your hand, you might be like, oh, I don't know, it's a spoon, it's a ladle, it's a sewing needle, it's my shovel, it's my basketball, it's the scissors I use to cut my hair, it's my cello, it's my trumpet, it's my keys, it's a very ordinary thing. Why are you asking me, God? I mean, Moses knows why this is important. This is what he uses for his sheep. This is what he used to protect them. This is what he used to sort them out. But Moses is baffled why God would think that something so ordinary in his life might have some merit and place in the plan for salvation. God is like, this is too ordinary to be anything but what I use on a day-to-day basis. And listen, this is important. I'm coming now to the main point of the sermon. I remember a few years ago when my daughter was about two years old, a friend of ours came to visit from Vancouver, BC, and he brought, um, you know, some gifts. He was happy to see us, and as he was leaving, he gave my daughter 50 bucks. Excuse me, 50 Canadian dollars. With no disrespect to our Canadian brethren, of which there are many here, it's not the same as a greenback. And so my daughter, two years old, is given 50 Canadian dollars, and I would take it in a heartbeat. I would not snivel at 50 Canadian dollars. And she turns around, and, I, and this, I mean, we, preachers will exaggerate for effect, but this is not one of those times. She takes the money, and her face contorts, and she looks absolutely horrified. She squeezes her face, throws the money on the floor, turns her back on him, and refuses to look at him. And here we are, we're like, my goodness, you just got given $50, and you have no idea what's in your hand. You've got no idea the value or the worth of what you have, and so you throw it away, and you are angry when it's given to you. And we find Moses here, not quite like my two-year-old daughter, but he hasn't figured it out, and this is it. And if you have your phone, because most of you are rather going to take pictures than write it, I would encourage you to have your your camera out because this will not come back. And this is it. This This is where the sermon is going. This is the question if your parent asks you, did you go to church and what did the pastor preach about? This is the question when someone says, oh, what was the sermon about today? And you say it was about Moses. This is the line. The secret to living a significant life is not dependent on the strength of your hand, but on the clarity of your sight. This is what Moses has to learn. This is what God is trying to show him. Yes, the staff is common. Yes, it's not special, but that's the point. Every shepherd has one. All of you have got everyday common items, your time, your kitchen, your garage, your workshop, your laptop. And all of you have the potential with these ordinary, everyday things in your possession to do incredible things with it if you have the imagination to see what you have in your hand. 
And as Christians, it's more specific than just having an imagination to do great things. Sure, if you learn how to use your keyboard, you can code and build a website, but this is more specific than that. This is about being awake to God's purpose for your life so that you can be an agent to bring justice, hope, and liberty to those who are the least, the last, the lost, and the left behind. This is where Moses is, and this is where we are. In fact, just this week, you know, I was reading, no, I was not reading, I was in a meeting, and someone slid the paper across the table, and I saw an example of this. On the front cover, I saw this, and I was like, oh, I know this guy. I know this guy, Mitchell Powers, Azu uh, Spiritual VP. What's he doing on the front of the Union Bulletin? Grace in the Cosmetics aisle, College Place program aims to curb shoplifting at Walmart. So I read the article. Turns out that College Place, especially the Walmart, which has 90% of the shoplifting cases in College Place, runs close to a million dollar deficit every year from shoplifting. It's significant. About 145 people every year are arrested. And so Mitchell, who had come uh, to Walla Walla, had some interest in research around recidivism and how you can help people not to be in a cycle of constantly committing these petty crimes. And he found himself, this theology student, put on the board at Walla, excuse me, put on a board at College Place, a board about diversity and inclusion, and he takes his ordinary laptop and he opens his laptop and goes to Google and he starts to do some research. He does research on how you can find and create better diversion programs for those who are caught shoplifting. And then this young man, this 21-year-old, takes his research to the board of College Place, to the city of College Place, and he's not expecting much. He's like, oh, it's probably going to get mothballed. It's going to be uh, thrown away somewhere, not see the light of day for years. But to his surprise, a couple of months later, they come to him and they decide to take up the cause and the attorney for the city and Mitchell go and present this and a program has now began, that's why this article was put out, to reduce shoplifting while giving compassion for the desperate. Because many of the people, they're not trying to steal flat screen TVs, David. They're like, they're taking soap. They're taking, they're taking shampoo and conditioner because their life is hard. And so they go and they present this and now people have the opportunity to make better decisions, to get help, to get programs, all because he understood and saw differently with a laptop in his hand, with a staff in his hand. So the question, you've been hearing the question, even though I haven't said it, it's what's in your hand? What ordinary thing do you have in your hand? Some of you have lived long enough to have already figured it out, and you know what's in your hand is your kitchen. You know what's in your hand is the flour and the water and the yeast that you combine and bake bread and give to people who are in need of it. You've recognized, some of you, that what's in your hand are the ordinary flowers that are around your home that you cut and take to the bedside of those who are sick. Some of you have also recognized that what's in your hand is your ability to move zeros from one account to another. And to have the ability to use that ordinary zero in your bank account to move it somewhere else and to help a child and a family who can't afford to send their kids to Christian education be able to go to Wava or Rogers because you realize what's in your hand. Some of you have realized what's in your hand is the ability to write. And so you write to state legislators when something unjust happens and you petition them that this must change. The pen is in your hand. And some of you, you dip your brushes in paint and you create beauty that brings healing to the soul of others. Oh, and how can I forget? Some of you play music. And when you play music and you recognize what's in your hand, you are used by God to bring hope and healing for those who do not have it. What's in your hand today? Those who are watching, what's in your hand? 
What has God given to you that is ordinary and that can be used for his glory when we have a clarity of sight rather than focusing on the deficiency of our strength? And if you're like me, perhaps your internal conversation, and I'm ending now, maybe, you know what? Yeah, appreciate the sermon, heard this one before, not too much new, nice stuff, but I'm not doing anything different. You still have internal resistance And you're telling yourself the opposite of what God told Moses. It's not about the superheroes. We are not looking for Navy SEALs. We are not looking for the people who can be on Americans Got Talent. We are looking for ordinary people with ordinary things in their hand who recognize that God can take the ordinary and do extraordinary things with it. And so your qualification is the very fact that you are ordinary. Your qualification is the very fact that you don't think you have anything to offer. And what God invites you to do today is to take inventory of your life. It's to ask yourself, what do I have that with a God-saturated imagination can become used for hope and for healing and to bring people into liberty. Now, there's two other excuses that I'm not going to go into, but the the two excuses Moses gives are hilarious. One is basically, I don't have the ability, so please, I can't do it. And then I love the last one. God is, Moses is basically just like, nah, I'm not going to do it. I put fear about his calling, but I I wanted to write, nah, I'm not going to do it. But that wouldn't work with my Fs, so I just didn't write it. But the last one is, no, nah, I'm just not going to do it. God asked him, and Moses finally comes clean. He's like, you know what? I'm giving you all of these excuses, but at the, bottom, at the end of the day, I just don't want to do it. That's it. Just not interested. <laughs> and I love that Moses can have this conversation with God, and God just engages his questions and his doubts and his fears, and God allows his uh, brother Aaron to come so they can do this thing together. Let me end with this, my friends. Let me end with this. Although I was being a little brutish at the beginning, when I said, hey, you need to change your plans, cancel your date night, don't go to your daughter's volleyball game, and be involved on Wednesday, I really do mean it. Let me put this slide up again. Wednesday, service day, if you're a student, sure, there's other ways you can be involved. Sure, there's other ways you can say, well, I have something else in my hand, but I'm encouraging you to sign up from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. to become an agent of change, to bring wholeness and liberty in our community. We want to add to our community, not just take away from it. And then, for those who are not university students, there is an opportunity from 6.30 to 7.30. You come to the youth room, you will have a task, and you'll be sent out. It may be to visit someone. It may be to drop something off. It may be to do something that may feel slightly uncomfortable to bring hope in the life of other people. And I recognize that those who are watching online may not be able to do that. Some of you really do have a shift at the hospital, and you're like, can't do it. But please don't let yourself off the hook that easily. Ask yourself, what is in your hand? What is ordinary that in the hands of God can come alive and can be extraordinary? And I'm asking that all of us do that because God asks these questions, not because he wants to shame us, not because he wants us to feel inadequate, but because he wants to reveal his grace in our life, because he wants to come in our life and do something that will make such a big difference. And listen, as you're thinking about it, I'm going to invite my uh, friends up We're going to have a uh, a song for you to meditate on as as we respond to this question of what's in your hand. And then following the song, we're going to have our communion together. And I'm going to give you a heads up. You may want to try and open the top of your communion cups already. It takes a while to get it done. But as you're thinking about it, um, let's meditate together on this question that God has asked, what is in your hand? Thank you.
If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. And take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. You called Moses from the wilderness, and you put a staff in his hand. You used him to lead your people to the promised land. And Lord, I'm willing to trust in you, so take my life and use me too. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me too. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Oh, oh. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use, you can use me. Take my hands, Lord, and my feet. Touch my heart, Lord, and speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. When David fought Goliath, and that mighty, mighty giant fell, he proved to his people oh, that God was alive in Israel. But Lord, I'm available and I want to be used. So Lord, use me. If you can use anything, you can use me too.
If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. Take these hands, Lord, and these feet. Touch my heart, Lord, and speak through me. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me. now we come to communion, and I hope you have opened the top of, of the communion emblem that you have. If you don't have any, we do have some in the, in the lobby, so we can get that to you. And of course, this call to be used by God for many of us still fills us with fear, but we serve a God who has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And in this moment, we recommit ourselves to him. So my friends, this is the table of the Lord. And it is made ready for those who love him and who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and, who, and you who have not been here for long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come because the Lord invites you, and it is His will that all those who want to should meet Him here. And on this day, we remember the gift of transforming love as we share together in the holy meal and tell its story anew. And this is the story that we tell, that on that night, long ago when Jesus gave Himself up for us, He took bread and he gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, God, in remembrance of your mighty acts, we come together as your people, as your church, the Walla Walla University Church, and we offer ourselves into your hands with praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, only made possible because of Christ's great sacrifice for us. And as a church, as a body, we proclaim by faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, we pray that you will grant us your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that the bread and the cup we partook of will stand as tangible symbols of the love and new life offered to us as disciples of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will bind us together, not despite our differences, but through them, that you will knit us together as the body of Christ. Help us joyfully serve one another in ways that affirm the sacred worth and the breath of God that lives in us. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast all together at that great heavenly banquet. We ask this through the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we read... The Bible, we read that the disciples, after they had taken part of the table, that they left 
And as they were leaving, they sang a hymn together. So we're going to do that at this time. We're going to have a closing hymn uh, as we conclude our service. Let's pray. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance and give you peace now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We want to thank all of those who joined us for worship, both here and online, and invite you next week as we continue our series with the question uh, that God asked Elijah. What's the question, Pastor Jose? I've forgotten. <laughs> I'm waiting for a, a Bible scholar to tell me what the question is. I've completely forgotten. What are you doing here? Thank you. Join us next week. And if I can figure out my life, we will have a sermon from Elijah. What, what are you doing here? And as, we, and as you leave, we also want to remind you that we always collect a benevolent fund. You've been so gracious during COVID to give 
just incredibly to that benevolent fund to help families who are struggling in our congregation. So this is a wonderful time to do so. You can mark it on your envelopes and put it in the uh, check, um, the connect box or give online. And as we end, we want to invite you for our post loo to listen to two people who will, uh, by the grace of God, show us what is in their hand. Again, thank you for joining us this week. We hope that the service was a blessing to you and we're so glad you worshiped with us this Sabbath. Please let us know where you're joining us from. You can send us a message on our social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, on our church website. And we pray that you have a wonderful week and God's richest blessings go with you.